Well, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. I'm Daniel. Welcome to Mountain Springs on Daylight Savings Weekend. How many of you usually come to the 8.30 service? I wondered as much. There were like 14 people here earlier. I'm just kidding. Hey, uh, so glad you're here. If you're a guest with us, I extend a very warm welcome to you. If you're streaming online with us right now, we're so grateful that you're part of this tribe on our weekend. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, we're also then going to be in Luke 24, and then we're going to be in Acts 1. What we're going to do this weekend is we're going to kind of really set the stage for the next kind of wave of what it is that we're calling the Spirit, the Personhood of the Holy Spirit series. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we started this series with a message on the theology of the Holy Spirit. It was a very foundational message as it relates to who is the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the co-equal member of the triune nature of God, God in three persons, the blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. We kind of laid that foundation. And then last weekend, Dr. E from the sanctuary was here, did a message on the power of the Holy Spirit. By the way, quite ironically so, during the 11.30 service on a message about the power of the Holy Spirit, we had a power outage, true story. Power went out on our campus. We have three legs of power, two went out. This room was ushered into darkness and he was up here with a small glow on his face. I think it was the Spirit, but anyway, I don't know. Anyway, that was all last weekend. But anyway, here's the reason I'm kind of, we're really kind of laying the foundation. The foundation that we've been laying is really essential to this series and it's really essential to this weekend's message where we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This series has kind of been put onto the schedule for Mountain Springs this spring, this winter, for this reason. There are many of us that through one bad teaching or another, or a bad situation with a pastor or another, that we have been misinformed as to who the Holy Spirit is, and being misinformed about the Holy Spirit or seeing an abuse of the Holy Spirit, it has shaped our receptivity towards the Holy Spirit. The reason this series is so important is because we don't want to be misinformed about the greatest gift that God has given to us with Jesus to live the victorious Christian missional life. So that's the reason we're doing this series, because so many of us have been misinformed about the Spirit, and it's therefore created a distance or a detachment from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as I mentioned this weekend, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I know, depending upon your maybe church background or theological background, if you have one, uh, you might have a preconceived notion as to what I'm going to say or what I ought to say or what I ought not say. And so as we go through this, I want you to know this one thing. This weekend's message, as with maybe some other messages of this ilk, it's an open-handed weekend, meaning there are things in the Gospels, there are things in the Scripture that are closed-handed issues. Closed-handed would be the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. That's a closed-handed issue. You cannot say, I don't believe that, and still profess Orthodox Christian evangelical faith. It's a closed-handed issue. However, there are some open-handed issues, and one of the open-handed issues might be, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and what does it look like? And so I would say this weekend's message goes in the ladder of an open-handed. I'm going to share this weekend using some Queen's English words, but also some Greek words thrown in for good measure, what I believe is the sequence or the different wakes or iterations of the Holy Spirit through the New Testament. I'm going to give you three Greek prepositional phrases, and we're going to walk through it very systematically and then personally apply it to our lives in about 25 or so minutes from now. So we've got a lot that we're going to cover. First, I'm going to kind of reset the table by talking about the Spirit, and then we're going to go into the waves of the Spirit, and then we're going to apply it, then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go home for lunch. Deal. Done. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, so much for all that you are doing in and through this weekend, through your church, Mountain Springs, through the churches of our community. Father, we pray that this weekend we would be able to rest in the finished work of the cross and look toward the ongoing work of the Spirit to live the victorious Christian life. Father, we pray that no matter how we came today, whether stressed, have anxiety, feeling depressed, or whether we feel like we're on the top of our game. We're like, man, this is a great chapter for my life. Lord, we all pause and say we want more of you. 
We want you to do extraordinary things in our lives. We want you to bring about breakthrough. We want you to set us free from temptation. We want you to be the victorious one in our lives. Redeem us and set us free. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Luke 3. Luke 3, verse 16 uh, is where we see John talking really about Jesus and the coming baptisms, not baptism, but plural, baptisms of the Spirit. It says in verse 16, John answered saying, I baptize you with water. Baptism means to be fully immersed. It means to be utterly drenched. When John says, I baptize you with water, it's a believer's baptism to where people are entirely immersed under the surface of the water and come back forth. It is a public proclamation of a private commitment to Jesus. That's what baptism is. Baptism isn't salvation. Baptism is the demonstration of salvation. It is me saying, I want people to see what God's done in me. I want people to know it. I want it to be a witness. And so John says, I came to baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals, whose tavers, I am not worthy to untie. He, Jesus, will baptize you with, and then look at this, the Holy Spirit and fire. I love it. As an American saying, fire is so much more strong than as a British person saying, fire. Anyway, (laughs) turn now to Luke 24, Luke 24, verse 49, Luke 24. Now what we're about to see is now Jesus speaking about that which John said of him. So Jesus himself is speaking about this baptism. He says in verse 49, I am sending the promise of the Father, my Father, upon you. I want you, if you love to highlight and underline things in the Bible, highlight or underline the word upon Upon. That is the third of the three Greek prepositional phrases that you're going to hear me talk about here in a few minutes. Jesus says, I'm sending something to you. It is the promise of my Father, and it will come upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. So Jesus' words affirm what John said about him. John said, I'm going to dunk you in water. Jesus is going to come and immerse you in the spirit and fire. Jesus then says, some chapters later, Luke 24, there will be a time when the promise of the Father comes, you will be baptized with this fire and of the spirit, but wait, wait. We'll now turn over to Acts 1. Acts 1 verse 4. While staying with them, Jesus, okay, so we're following the narrative of Jesus and the spirit. Jesus orders them not to depart from Jerusalem. But to wait, in other words, there's something worth waiting for, for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will now be baptized with the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons is that there is confusion around baptism or the baptism of the Spirit is because there are numerous baptisms listed in the New Testament. The one that Jesus speaks about is the baptism with the Spirit, and he says, not many days from now. Verse 8, he says, you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you. There's that Greek prepositional phrase again, upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The next verse, verse 9, is the final verse that we have recorded of Jesus in the Scripture. And he uses this verse to essentially remind them, listen, I need you to wait to receive power. Verse 9, when Jesus said these things, they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Notice this is not a visitation of the Spirit. This is the habitation of the Spirit. This is the Spirit coming and resting. One receives, the Spirit rests upon each one of them. Verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I believe without reservation that that which we read of in Luke 3, Luke 24 
Acts 1 is the result of, therefore, the coming of the Spirit in Acts 2. I believe that Acts 2 represents the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was powerful for them then as it is for us today. I believe that the Spirit's work is as present, as accessible, as available today as it was then. So let's talk about us for a moment. If you've been a Jesus follower, if you've loved the Lord for some time, it is possible, though not definite, but it's possible that someone has said to you, okay, are you a Spirit-filled Christian? And usually that question comes with some degree of strings attached, uh, i.e., I hope you are, or I hope you're not. Uh, And so usually it comes with some realm of confusion or negativity. We've even had phone calls as a church, Mountain Springs. Are you spirit-filled? And I can tell usually when the person asks, they have a very strong opinion one way or the other. And they're like, we sure hope you're not because we're not coming if you are. And we also hear the opposite. We sure hope you are because if you're not, we're not coming. And so I'm like, what do you want me to say? They're like, the right answer. And I'm like, it depends on the day. But theologically speaking... (laughs) We are spirit-filled. Yes, we're spirit-filled. Okay, so why is there confusion? Because if you don't know this, let me tell you, there is some confusion and tension regarding this issue. In fact, people have lost their jobs at seminaries over their position on the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit. People have lost their jobs at churches. Uh, Christians have had relationships strained because of their viewpoint on the Spirit. But why the tension. Now, let me explain why the tension. Let me try and be as clear as I can. The tension regarding the Spirit is built upon this one issue. Is there a one and done, or are there more than one time, is there more than one time where you will, quote, receive the Spirit? Meaning, when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, this is the tension, when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, do you receive everything? There will be those that say, yes, you do. Then there would be those that would say, you receive a lot. You receive so much, but you don't receive all that God has intended for you. That is where the distinction is. Some call it the second wave or a second expression or a second experience. The reason there's tension is because some would say here, the one and done, they would say, so you're saying that the work of Jesus is insufficient? So it's just one time. There would be people here saying, no, 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 no. The work of Jesus is sufficient but because of poor choices on my part or because of ministry and pouring out, I either burn the oil of the Spirit or I leak it through poor choices. Therefore, I need more coming upon me. So I want to explain to you how I believe it's this, not this. And again, this is going to come today from me being raised in both a charismatic Baptist church, which sounds oxymoronic. A charismatic Baptist was my upbringing, while also I want to use a framework that the late founder of the Calvary Chapel movement, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, he formed essentially through looking at the Greek prepositional phrases in the New Testament of the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to use both of these frames, and I'm going to walk you through that now. So the first one, if you have your app open. We use the app here to take notes. If you want to take notes, you can. The first Greek prepositional phrase is the action para, P-A-R-A, P-A-R-A. John 14, turn with me to John 14. John 14 is this text to where this is the first of many verses that we'll look at to kind of flesh out and fill in each of these three phases. John 14 is where the disciples are worried because Jesus is leaving. They're like, no, 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 don't go. And he's like, dude, I gotta go. But you got something really good coming. He then says this in verse 16, I'm gonna ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So the first thing that we learn about the Holy Spirit is that he will be with. The word para can be translated as with. The Holy Spirit, the first thing we learn is that He will be with us or around us, around us. The word that Jesus uses is the word helper. The word helper is translated from the Greek word parakletos. Para means to come alongside. Kletos means to call. In other words, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is one that is called to come alongside. Called to come alongside. I believe that we will see the first time in our lives the work of the Holy Spirit, now don't miss this, prior to salvation. 
prior to salvation. I believe that the work of the Holy Spirit is around us drawing our hearts towards Jesus. For some of you, you have had a bad experience in church or a bad experience in life. Something created a wall. But now you're here today or you've come the last few weeks and the Holy Spirit, maybe you're far from God and you don't feel like you have a faith or a belief or anything like that. The Holy Spirit is doing a work around you to draw you back to Jesus. Now let me explain it in a different way. Think of the person at work that just annoys the tar out of you. You're like, man, I just don't like you. You make me want to resign. Like truly, you're not a nice person, but something's happening with this person. And three months ago, they really got under your skin. Something has happened. You're changing towards them. But all of a sudden, a week and a half ago, they said something to you and said, there's something different about you. I can't keep living life the way I'm living it. It's not working. I don't want to live this way. My wife doesn't want me to live this way. My kids need me to be a different dad. I believe that is the work of the Holy Spirit around them, wooing them, convicting them. We don't get better. I'm of the belief that we don't get better on our own. We need the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe the first of the three phrases, para, means the Spirit at work around us. So much so. The Spirit does such a work in us to woo us, to win us to Jesus, that Jesus redeems us. And the point of Jesus redeeming us, the Spirit regenerates us. Okay, a lot of fancy words, track with me. Jesus redeems us, but at the point of us surrendering our hearts to Jesus, we go to the second word. The second word, and that is the word en. Greek prepositional phrase, en, E-N. And it means in. I believe that when you surrender your heart to Jesus, the Spirit comes to live within you. We're a temple, Paul says, of the Holy Spirit. Romans tells us this, Romans 8, 9. You are now not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. I believe that when you surrender your heart to Jesus, the Spirit comes to live within you. Paul then elaborates in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.13, if you want to turn with me, a very famous verse. Ephesians 1.13 says, When you believed... Okay, so when you believed, when you put your trust in Jesus, you were, so a process is occurring, sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, when you made a choice based upon the quickening work of the Spirit to surrender your heart to Jesus, the Spirit then sealed that decision. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I do believe that there might be those some that believe they're saved and they are not, but I do not believe you can genuinely be saved and lose it. Why? It's sealed. It can't get out. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit does a sealing work. Okay, this is where the debate comes in. So now everyone that has a strong opinion about this, of those of you that maybe do, there's maybe 10 of you or seven of you, strap on, hold on, here we go. I don't believe that's it. I don't believe that's all there is to the work of the Spirit. Now, I'm not limiting the work of Jesus. I just believe there is something about Jesus and of the Spirit that is beyond the sealing and the filling. So much so, the third Greek prepositional phrase is the word epi, E-P-I. Epi means to come upon, to come upon. Now, turn back with me to Acts 1 for a moment. Acts 1. Acts 1 is where Jesus commands the believers, to not leave Jerusalem, but he says to wait for what the Father had promised. Okay, don't forget, when Jesus says to the believers, they are people of faith. They've been sealed. They've been filled. They've received the end work of the Spirit in them, and yet Jesus says, wait. In other words, Don't go about doing anything without the power that you need. I need you to wait. And they're like, whoa, 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 we're filled. We're sealed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wait, there's something more to come. And then look what verse eight says. You will receive power when this Holy Spirit has come epi upon you. I believe that the third Greek prepositional phrase, which means to come upon or to wash upon, is what I believe is the fulfillment or the promise that God has got for us. I believe that we as a Christian community should be looking for the overflow of the Spirit on our lives. 
We shouldn't just say, okay, the Spirit is at work around me. The Spirit is at work within me. I believe there should be this pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon us. Okay, some of you would say, yeah, I'm not sure I track with that. I think you get everything at the point of salvation. Now, let me tell you, I used to agree with you. I'm not sure that I do now because of Acts 19. Turn with me to Acts 19. It's our last big reference that we'll look at until the next one. Just kidding. Acts 19. Acts 19. Acts 19 is this incredible text where Paul goes on a ministry trip. He goes on a missionary journey and he encounters some Ephesian believers. Believers. Remember believers. And yet he notices something about the believers and he says something doesn't seem quite right. Something seems off. Yeah, I get much of what you're doing, but something seems incomplete. And to get to the bottom of his suspicions, he asks the question. And look what question he says in verse 2. Did you receive, okay, that's the same word that Jesus uses. Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Okay, so Paul seems to have no problem believing that we can be won by the saving grace, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, and yet not receive the fullness of the Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? And they go, no, 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 we didn't even know. There was a Holy Spirit. Okay, joke for a moment. There are some of us that come from church backgrounds where it would be as if your church environment was that verse. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. We just go through the motions. Well, friends, I believe that the Holy Spirit is real, is a person, and wants to transform our lives for Jesus. And sure enough, he then says, okay, okay, we've got to pray. So he says, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Okay, remember Luke 3, John's come to baptize into water, repentance. Paul says, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, Jesus. That is, Jesus, and on hearing this, they were baptized into Jesus. But then look what verse 6 says. And when Paul laid his hands on them, believers, when he lays his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Okay, it's the same word, epi. The Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, 20 years after Pentecost, Acts 19, believers, when the Spirit came upon them, they had a prayer language, they prophesied. There was this transformational work that the Spirit did in them because He came upon them. Okay, When you look through the Scripture, there is any number of responses to the work of the Holy Spirit. Some, theologically, in entire denominations, if you have a background in the assembly of God, for example, they would believe that the initial evidence of the filling of the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit is speaking with a prayer language, speaking in what they call uh, glossalia or tongues, I don't believe that. I believe there are a number of evidences. I believe you could receive that. I believe there can be others. But let me tell you, when you look through the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, things change. Things change. We change. Okay, now let me back up for a moment and speak to really what I see as a landscape of the New Testament. The New Testament, faith in the New Testament, is not adhering to a set set of doctrine. It is that, but it's more than that. In the New Testament, faith is not about living a high moral life, though that is the fruit of a Christian life. That is not the Christian life. The Christian life in the New Testament is living a life in hungry pursuit of the personhood of God and asking God to do extraordinary things in your life. When you look at the book of Acts, it is remarkable what they do. You're like, man, that's exhausting just reading it. The amount of times you see suddenly and suddenly and suddenly and the Spirit and this and that and the miraculous. Don't chase the signs, but chase the sign, the person that is the the, the creator of the power. Chase God. Get after the Holy Spirit. Well, as a people, I want us to be a people that go after the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not the weird spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to make you holy. The clue is in the term. 
to make you holy, not weird. And some people, and this is where we sometimes get off because we're like, man, the people that claim to have the most, quote, most Holy Spirit are the most weird. You're like, I would love the Spirit. I just don't want to be like you. Okay, so I know that. I know that. I want to tell you, though, don't disconnect from the reality and the fruit of the gifts of the power of the Holy Spirit because of some bad situation. So here's what I want to tell you. I want to give you four points that I believe we should do to position our lives to receive the epi, the Holy Spirit coming upon us, to be a people that are going after God and seeing extraordinary things in our lives. The first one is this, to really position your life to receive that filling of the Spirit. Number one, surrender your life. Surrender your life. If you want more of God, and you want more of God in your life, go out of your way to absolutely surrender your life. Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something given and left there. Some pastor has said many years ago, I heard this when I was a little boy, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it crawls off the altar. It's there and it's gone. Well, that's what we do with our lives. We say, I want to present my body as a living sacrifice, but on Monday, I got stuff to do. Wednesday night, I don't want to do that. Thursday night, I don't want to pray. I want to go do this. Friday, man, it's almost the weekend. We don't want to do that. Men and women, if you want more of God, Surrender your life. Surrender your life. Point two, ask and receive. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? There is no formula to asking. In fact, I recall when I asked for, quote, asked for the Holy Spirit, my prayer was schizophrenic. It was like, Holy Spirit, I want you. I'm quite convinced I want you in my life. I see some weird things in others, but I don't want that. But Holy Spirit, I think I want you. I love living here. Don't send me to Africa, Holy Spirit, but send me wherever you want to send me. (laughs) Like it's schizophrenic. And the Holy Spirit, yet honors that prayer. Here's the key to the prayer of the Holy Spirit. Be hungry. Be desperate. Be desperate. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after the righteousness of the kingdom. Hunger and thirst. It doesn't matter if your prayer is a little meandering. It hasn't got to be articulate. It's got to be authentic. When you pray an authentic, hungry prayer, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why does all of this matter? This isn't just a theological exercise. This is the empowerment that we need to change the world, change our world, and be transformed. We need this. When I have more, so to speak, of the Spirit active in my life through a greater surrender of my life, I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better leader. I'm a better person. Why? Because there's less of me getting in the way. We're full of something. Don't be full of that. Be full of the Spirit. Be full of God. Be hungry. Be going after God. Number three, obey in everything. Acts 5.32, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. You've heard the phrase, delayed obedience is disobedience. Go out of your way. When God says something, follow Him and do it. Next weekend in this series, we're going to talk about hearing the voice of God. And let me tell you, everything that I speak of next weekend will be predicated upon obedience. The greatest challenge to, quote, hearing the voice of God is not discerning necessarily, but obeying. Obeying that we should know and then do and be. I'm telling you, let's be an obedient people. Think of the last time that the Spirit of God spoke something into your life. Don't do that. Don't say that. And you're like, it feels so good when I say it. Don't say that. But it feels so, don't say it. And allow the Spirit of God to cause you to say less, to be more, to be fully present, to not control or manipulate, but to allow the Spirit of God to conform you into the image of Jesus. It's like the Spirit pushes us into the shape and the make of Jesus. Be an obedient people. I'm saying this to myself as much, if not more than you. Let's be an obedient people. So surrender your life, ask and receive, be obedient. And the fourth point is this, live by faith. Live by faith. Galatians 3.2 says, Did you receive 
the Spirit by works of the law or, so the emphasis is, this is how you got the Spirit, by hearing with faith. Men and women, the bottom line of this weekend's message is this. I want you to know the amazing person that is the Holy Spirit. I want us to get all that God has got for us. This message isn't about going beyond the bounds of Scripture. This message is about going to the bounds of Scripture. This is not about doing something that is extra biblical or unbiblical. This is about biblical living. Jesus says, I'm leaving. I'm checking out for a bit. I'm going to come back. But while I'm gone, don't worry, don't worry. You're going to have power. We cannot create distance from the very life and power that we need. So many people, so many friends of mine, so many friends of yours, and maybe you yourself, live a life where you go from one temptation to the other, one sin cycle to the other, one argument to the next, one fractured relationship to the other. And it's everyone else's fault but your own. And the Spirit of God says, can I transform you? Can I change you? I believe it's the work of the Holy Spirit that changes us in collaboration with the finality of the cross, the beauty of the Word, the beckoning of the Father, and the empowerment of the Spirit. We can see victory over those temptations. We can be no longer subject to that yoke of slavery. We can live life victory. We can live life victoriously. We can see breakthrough over those things. You don't just need to have a mouth. Well, this is my mouth. This is the way I talk. Anytime you make that phrase, this is the way I am, you are limiting the impact of the work of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. You do not need to be this way. You can't say, well, I'm just going to fix it. It's not working. We need the Spirit to come. The Spirit around, the Spirit within, and the Spirit upon that washes over us, cleanses us, and presents us. Remember, Jesus himself says in Hebrews, it was the work of the Spirit in my life that presented me unblemished before the Father. Spirit of God, come, stir us up. As we close, we're going to close by doing something very practical. If this were a conference tonight and we were gathered here and it was Friday night and we had all night, we would probably do this next segment differently. But what I want to do though is not just preach this and then say, bless you, have a great week, but then say, Holy Spirit, come. Come baptize us in the Spirit. Come wash over us right now. We're not going to belabor this, but I am going to invite you to continue this when you get home. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and baptize you. But if you would say right now, in just a moment, I'm going to invite those of you that would respond to these two things to stand. Number one, you would say, I have yet to receive what I believe is the fullness of the Spirit, the epi of the Spirit, the Acts 19 where the Spirit came upon and you would say, I gotta live in that. I gotta live in the victory of the work of the Spirit in my life. I want that. In just a moment, I want you to stand. You might also say, I'm walking and living in the fullness of the Spirit, but I gotta be honest, it feels like the tank is running dry. I know as Laurie and I have looked back over the past six to nine months of our lives, we're like, man, this tank seems to be running dry. We've got to put more in and not just let it drain out. And you would say, yeah, I want to stand. I want my tank to be replenished. I want the pouring upon to fill within. Would you stand? So one of those two things or both of those things, would you stand? And I'm going to pray. I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to start praying. Lord Jesus, you see us right now. We are hungry. And we pray right now, would you fall afresh upon us? Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us, we pray. Holy Spirit, we've seen you move. We've seen you do the miraculous. We've seen signs and wonders, gifts, fruit. Lord, we pray for greater fruits in our lives. We pray that the fruit of our lives and the fruit upon the tree of our life would even grow upon the trees of others because of our ministry to them. Lord, pour into us. And Father, we pray that we would see victory in Jesus' Name. I speak victory right now in Jesus' Name over each one of us in our temptation, in our struggle cycle, in whatever it is that seems to pull us back, Spirit of God, set us apart. Set us free. Spirit of God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh upon your church, Mountain Springs. Fall afresh upon our town. Spirit of God, fall afresh upon our nation. Spirit of God, come visit us again. 
We don't just want a cerebral understanding. We want an intimate realization through relationship of the work of the Spirit. Spirit, come. Spirit, come. We honour you today. We pray, Jesus, that we would be a people that would live with our eyes focused on you through the empowerment of the Spirit to bring glory to the Father who is in heaven. Let's open our eyes. Let's all stand. As we close, I want to leave you with one thought. I want you to go home today. I want you to find some time alone. Maybe go for a jog, go for a hike, do something, veg in front of the TV, but turn it off for a few minutes and then say this. Holy Spirit, I need more of you. No matter where you're at on the mechanics of today's message, don't miss the message within the mechanics. Don't miss the value of saying, Holy Spirit, come and take your next step. For some of you, your next step with God is don't click. Don't undo the bottle. Don't look anymore. Don't keep talking to her. Don't keep talking to him. That's the next step. For some of you, your next step is start the group. For some of you, your next step is plant the church. For some of you, your next step is share the gospel with that person that keeps asking about your hope for the joy that is within you. Take your next step. And next weekend as we come, we're going to talk about how do we hear the voice of God? Let me tell you, that is a mystery. We're going to try and demystify it and yet embrace the mystery of God. We're going to try and straddle that. But it's all about obedience. Take the next step. Lord Jesus, we honour you. We bless you. We love you. We couldn't do any of this without you. We honour you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want-